Welcome. My name is Scott Harrison, one of the pastors here at Grace Baptist Church in Millersville. Uh, we hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. We look forward to when we can meet together again uh, here at the church. But until then, we, we hope you find these videos of encouragement encouraging. Uh, if you have prayer requests, please send them in to Nancy Pletcher. Uh, she'll make sure that the elders or the, or the pastors or even the congregation at large will, will get those and we can be praying for them. Also, we would encourage you to take a look at our website, findgracehere.org, and, and there's a lot of information there that you can find that would be helpful for you as well. We are praying for you, and until we meet again, keep being safe. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? 
My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when we're proved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight the path for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. This is the word of the Lord. As we prepare to pray together, I just want to Read Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. If not, give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Would you bow your hearts and pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we, oh, we do give you thanks for today. We thank thank you knowing that you are sovereign, that there is nothing, Father, that all that is going on anywhere in our world or the universe that that you aren't in control of. It is easy to get lost in that, Father, in our everyday. Uh, It's easy to allow our worlds to become small. Would we pause just for a moment and, and just to, Oh, just to give you praise for, for who you are. To give you praise for all oh, the way that you construct and hold things together. Oh, to give you praise for the way that you have designed things to work. Father, in the, in the, midst, of, oh, in the midst of the shutdowns, in the midst of all the, mm, the, the chatter we hear, the the conversations we have, the new newscasts we, we listen to, the information we read, Father, would we, uh, would we just take a step back and, and recognize your sovereignty? Um, Father, we are becoming frustrated. As a people, we, uh, we want what we want. Um, it is easy for us to put our needs above others. Would we take a moment and recognize that we are called to do good to one another? Father, would we not grow weary of that act? In the interactions that we have uh, with our families, our Fellow believers, Father, our neighbors, our community, our leaders, Father, would we recognize how we speak? Would we be aware of how we treat one another? And Father, I know for many this this hits a little close to home. We are quick to speak our mind right now. In the midst of our frustration, we are quick to tell people what we think we know what we want to happen. Father, would we take a moment and remind ourselves that we are called to do good. Father, we do pray for those who are in leadership. Father, we do pray for those that are making decisions that, that do affect many of us. Would we be patient as we pray for them? Would we be encouraging as we pray for them? Would we recognize, Father, uh, that they are uh, trying to make decisions and policies uh, that would benefit everyone? Would we give the benefit of the doubt as we listen and read? 
Father, we also pray for those that are being affected greatly by these decisions. Father, we pray for those that are being directly affected by all these things that are going on. Father, we particularly think of those that are in nursing homes and retirement communities that are completely shut down, completely isolated, and feel very alone. Father, would we not just feel a burden for them? Would we not just feel drawn to pray for them? But Father, would we look for ways that we can reach out, look for ways that we can encourage them? Oh, Father, they... Father, we know that they are under your control and under your hand, uh, but Father, we also know that they feel very alone. We, as your people, pray that if it would be your will, this would end soon. Um, We, Father, pray as your people that you would continue to provide us with the energy. Father, that, that you would provide us with the stamina to continue to move forward in this and to move forward in ways that would be positive, move forward in ways that would be good, move forward, Father, in ways that would bring honor to your oh, to your name and not speak out of frustration, not speak out of uh, a, a, a desire to, to move forward, but we would do so in ways uh, that would be uplifting and encouraging and ultimately bring others to you in these moments. Father, continue to be with those that are providing care and service. Father, we thank you for those who are essential in this, our doctors, our nurses. Father, we think of those that are continually providing things for people. Uh, We even think of um, those that are teaching and leading in these moments. And it's, Father, we... We, we find ourselves just helpless in this. Uh, continue, to, continue to meet our needs, continue to provide for us, not just with substance and food and the basic needs, Father, but, but would you provide us with encouragement and love? Father, would you provide us with community again? You, You have told us to ask, and Father, we do today. We ask. And we know this is only possible because of your Son. This gift that you have given us that that allows us to approach your throne, that allows us to come before you and ask, Father, it is is in his name that we pray. It is in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, that we ask all these things. Amen. Pastor Scott and I just finished reading this book called The Care of Souls by Herod, Harold Sankbill. It was a great book. It's a book that's written for pastors to encourage them to sharpen their shepherding skills. And Sankbill argues that there's something that farmers know. He grew up on a farm in the Midwest. There's something that farmers know that pastors should know too. And I think it would help you. St. Bill says that if you are on a farm for decades, for year after year, you will live through times of abundant harvests, and you will live through lean seasons too. And wise farmers adjust. He says, like farms, past, uh, churches go through seasons too. There are uh, times when a pastor will be doing the exact same thing, with the same ministry and the same focus and the same passion, but they will not see the same fruit that they do see at other times. That is puzzling. Why is that? Have you noticed the same thing in your life? That there are seasons in your life, uh, spiritually speaking, that are more fruitful than others? You haven't changed. You can see no discernible change in your life, but there are sometimes of, of fruitful seasons when, when uh, God seems to be answering prayer and your spiritual life is vivid and the Bible is exciting for you to read and prayer is passionate and worship is, is sweet. And then there are other times, leaner seasons. Uh, times when God just seems absent or asleep. I want to help you with that by 
having you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 44, looking with you at this psalm that Derek Kidner, an Old Testament scholar, says Israel is lamenting, and Israel is lamenting in Psalm 44 over some of the baffling fluctuations in their relationship with God. The key question here in Psalm 44 is, what does it mean to walk by faith during lean seasons? Or, uh, to put it another way, how do you follow God when He seems absent or even asleep? I want to walk with you through Psalm 44. You might be surprised. This is not, not many people would identify Psalm 44 as one of their favorites. You might be surprised at some of the raw edges of Israel's complaint. Here's my plan for how I want to walk through Psalm 44 with you today. Uh, The psalm itself breaks up into five sections. There's 26 verses. I'm going to read each section as I talk about it, each of the five. And then before we finish, I want to give you four lessons from Psalm 44 for living in lean seasons. So first, the five sections of Psalm 44, and then lessons for lean seasons. Uh, Let's begin. The first section of Psalm 44 could be uh, titled, Past Joys, Past Joys, and it's in the first three verses of Psalm 44, so let me read it to you. We have heard it with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their days, in days long ago. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. So the psalm begins by remembering what God had done in the past. And the psalmist here is specifically thinking about the conquest of the land, Joshua leading the people of Israel into the promised land, defeating the people that lived there, and receiving this abundant blessing from God. And as God had commanded their ancestors, uh, they had heard the stories. God said, tell these stories to your children. And these people who wrote this psalm, they had heard the stories. They knew what God had done in the past. God was there strengthening the people. Without him, everything that had happened was inexplicable. You see some overlap here between this description of God strengthening the people and our lives as followers of Jesus. It's different, but, but similar. The Old Testament, because uh, in the Old Testament, people of God, the nation of Israel, they were a nation, they had a land, they had an army, and to follow God faithfully, they picked up their swords, they picked up their bows, and went to war. And they knew that with every swing of their swords and the stringing of their bows, God was strengthening them. God was helping them. Now, in the New Testament, we're not a nation with our land and an army uh, like in the Old Testament. Uh, We do not wage war against flesh and blood, Paul said in Ephesians. But we still are engaged in spiritual battles, and we do it with the strength that God provides. This actually reminds me of what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, the other apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You work hard. You feel hard. You you feel like you are working hard, but God is the one strengthening you and enabling you to do his work. That's what the Israelites had experienced in the past. Past joys. Now, uh, starting in uh, verses uh, 4 and continuing through verse 8, we have uh, present trust. Present trust. Listen. You are my king and my God, who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory, but you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. Just like the people in the past trusted God, so now this psalmist says, we're trusting you too. You strengthen us like you strengthen them. 
There's an image here in verse 5 that deserves some attention because of how the psalm develops and changes. But in verse 5, through you we push back, the word there is gore. Through your name we trample our foes. God makes the people uh, like an ox. They have the strength of an ox to fend off their enemies. Notice how that image changes when we move to the third section of Psalm 44, where we talk about uh, their current complaint, their current complaint, verse 9. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The people shake their head at us. I live in disgrace all day long, and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who approach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge." Look at the change that's taken place in these people. They still have the same trust in God, but now it appears that God has, uh, has abandoned them. Uh, some of the images th- th- that take place, or some of the things we can observe in this passage. Remember in verse 5, they had said that God, with his strength, makes them feel like an ox. They feel as strong as oxen. But in verse 10, they're like sheep. Scattered sheep, devoured sheep. God sold them, verse 12, for for next to nothing. You're not supposed to sell people. But if you sell people, you should at least have a good reason for it, right? You should at least make something for it. But, But God has sold the nation of Israel, and he's got nothing for it. The psalmist here is basically saying to God, you are a bad shepherd. Psalm 23 The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. John 10, Jesus is a good shepherd. But here the psalmist is saying to God, you are a bad shepherd. Your sheep are being decimated and you're not doing anything about it. Think about this complaint here that the psalmist is making. He is complaining on behalf of the nation like this. And these are words that God has given him to sing. I I read this. Sometimes I read the Psalms and I, I wonder, what are the conditions under which we and our church would sing this song? Whenever would Ryan and or I pick out a song like this for us to sing? We don't have songs that are this raw. We, we don't sing songs that, that reach down into sorrows like this. But this is a song that God gave the people to sing, and he expected them to sing it together when they gathered together for worship. That's astounding to me. The people here are not just defeated, they are demoralized. You see that in verse 15, I live in disgrace, my face is covered with shame, I have reproach and reviling. They haven't just lost in the battlefield, they've lost in their hearts and in their minds too. They are listening heavily, intently to what the people around them are saying, and it just is discouraging them. Who do you listen to? These Israelites here are listening to their enemies. They're listening to their enemies' scorn and derision, and it is demoralizing them. Now, there's an easy way that we would like to put Psalm 44 together. The easy way to put Psalm 44 together, this complaint, is to say, well, (laughs) it's because you've sinned. God is disciplining you. Those are the terms of the covenant that you have with God. If you disobey him, he said, this is what he said, he said that when you disobey, you would be uh, punished by enemies. God would allow his, uh, your enemies to, v- to have military victory over you. That's probably what's going on. Huh. 
So we get to verse 17, section 4 of Psalm 44, the people's innocence. Look what verse 17 says. All this came upon us, though we had not forgotten you. We had not been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet have not strayed from your path. But you crushed us, and you made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us over with a deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 22 is very important in this psalm. We'll come back to it uh, in a little bit. The people, like so many other times in the Psalms, I'm inclined to say, well, you're, just, you're being disciplined because of your sin. But the people say, we are innocent. We have not sinned. Now, they're not claiming to be perfect. What they're saying is we are keeping covenant with God. The covenant has provisions for the people when they sin, and the people are taking advantage of those provisions that God has made for them. They are following, they are keeping covenant with God, and there's no response from him. There, he doesn't challenge them. He doesn't question them. Huh. I think about this psalm sometimes, or this passage, you, you, uh, like what your children say to you sometimes. So imagine you're laying in bed at night and you hear this sound coming from one of their rooms. The house is supposed to be dark. You hear this sound. So you get up, and you walk in the room, you open the door, you sh- turn the light on, and you say, what's going on in here? What's happening? And what are you doing? And they say, nothing. And you think to yourself, oh, yeah, right, nothing. What was that sound that I heard then? You're, clearly you're doing something. Regardless of what you say, you're doing something. That's what I want to say to the Israelites. That's not what God says. So we take them at their word. They're innocent, and they're suffering. So the psalm ends, section 5 of Psalm 44, in verses 23 through 26, with the people's plea. Verse 23, Awake, Lord! Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself! Do not reject us forever! Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. God is sleeping. Remember I said sometimes it feels like God is absent or asleep. Here he is. He's taking a nap. You wonder if the disciples felt this way when they were on that stormy sea in the Gospels in Mark chapter 4 when Jesus was sleeping. Why are you sleeping? They said. Or I think of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Remember, there's a contest between him and all of the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal are crying out to Baal, answer us, Baal, hear us. And Elijah starts mocking them. Maybe he's sleeping, he says. God, you're sleeping. Verse 25, it says, we are brought down to the dust Adam in Genesis came from the dust, and the people are brought down to the dust. What's happening to them is killing them. It's decreating them. And verse 26, though, ends, these last words, rescue us because of your unfailing love, your covenant love. That's the Hebrew word chesed. It means loyal love. Who, in Psalm 44, is demonstrating greater loyalty to the covenant. Is it God or is it Israel? God or the people? Seems strange to say, but from their perspective at this point in time, it's the people and not God. So they're knocking on heaven, uh, knocking on heaven's doors. Answer us, answer us. Wake up, wake up. They're pleading with God. And that's how the psalm ends. With this question, this, this plea ringing. They're, they're asking this question, wondering if God is going to answer. We don't sing songs like that. When we, when we sing songs, we almost always uh, end them with hope. That, of course, God, God will do something. We, we don't end songs on minor notes when we sing. I, the one exception I can think of is the song that we sing that's based on Psalm 130, uh, more than 
watchman for the morning. I will wait for you, my God. I will wait. I will wait. And the song ends. Will God answer? Is he going to answer? God himself put this lament, this psalm, in, in his book to teach us how to voice our concerns when God seems absent or God seems asleep. This is how we faithfully speak. Let me finish by giving you some lessons, lessons from lean times. I have four of them. This psalm wants to shape your perspective, and so there are perspective lessons for you, four of them. First, look back. This psalmist encourages us to look back. That's what he does in the first three verses. He reminds himself and he reminds God of what God has done in the past. Uh, scholars who study the Psalms notice a pattern between Psalms 42, 43, and 44. They seem to go together. 42 and 43 are more about the individuals, and Psalm 44 is more about the nation. But even Psalm 42 has this remembrance. Psalm 42, 4 says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng." Remembering is good. It can be painful. Why isn't God doing today what he did yesterday? But it can be soothing too. We remember that our relationship with God is not an illusion. That God has been for us a real source of hope in the past. And he can be and will be a real source of hope for us in the future as well. We remember the past. We look back. I wonder if that's one of the reasons why the New Testament tells us to remember the Lord's death and resurrection through the Lord's Supper, through communion. We are to regularly partake of these elements, the bread that reminds us of Christ's broken body and the juice that reminds us of Christ's shed blood. Why are we supposed to look back like that? Well, it's the great evidence of God's love for us. God proves to us how much he loves us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We look back at the cross where Jesus bore the penalty for our sins, where he died as our substitute and rose again three days later. We look back to remember God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness, and it carries us. Our memories of that carry us through lean seasons. So look back. Secondly, look in. Look in. I'm hesitant to mention this because some of you have very tender consciences, but during lean seasons, it is appropriate. The Bible enjoins us to look in. Is this lean season happening because of discipline that God is bringing into my life? Is there some, is there sin that God is trying to draw my attention to? We have to think about that because it's a possibility that even occurred to the Israelites. Verse 17, they wouldn't say that they're innocent if it hadn't occurred to them to think about patterns of sin in their life that God was disciplining them for. So look in. Even if you have a tender conscience, look in. I warn you, some of you, again, soft-hearted brothers and sisters, you'll look in and you'll see a cavern a, a seeming black hole of ugliness and sinfulness and disregard from God. Can I encourage you that in Psalm 44, this psalm raises the possibility that, it, that you could look in and, and see faithfulness to God and a pattern of consistency and not find a specific sin that you need to root out of your life? Baffling fluctuations. There are sometimes baffling fluctuations in our relationship with God, and the fluctuation may not be in our hearts. In our circumstances, yes, but not in our hearts. So look in. Look up. Number three, third lesson, look up. Here are a confused, distressed, defeated people, and they're crying out to God. They're looking up to Him. Verse 22 is the only psalm in the passage here that, that offers any sort of, of answer or explanation of what's going on. It says, for your sake, we face death all day long. 
Because of the people's association with God, they're suffering. There are enemies of the world, and they attribute those enemies to their association with God. It's because of your sake that we are suffering as we are, because of our association with you. Uh, a few months ago, I was in the barber shop waiting for Luke to get a haircut, and I was talking with the guys that were there about uh, watching live sports. Uh, being in the stadium or in the arena or, uh, to watch your teams play. And they were talking about their various experiences. I've seen the Mavericks play in Dallas at the Reunion Arena at the time. I've seen the Rangers play at the stadium in Arlington. And they were talking about their experiences. Many of them had been to an Eagles game or a Phillies game. And, and uh, we were talking about that experience. And, and uh, uh, they, they said, you know, don't go see the Eagles live. That's not a good idea. You know, you Philadelphia fans do not have a great reputation when uh, uh, fans of the opponents show up. Uh, it, it's dangerous, isn't it? It's dangerous. It's not wise for you to wear a Dallas Cowboys jersey to go see the Philadelphia Eagles play the Cowboys in Philadelphia. It's not safe. When you became a follower of Jesus... You put on a Jesus jersey and you entered a contrary world. And for Jesus' sake, there is going to be opposition. There's going to be trouble. We live in a contrary world. The Apostle Paul brought this up. In fact, he quoted verse 22. I don't know if you recognize it, but he quoted verse 22 in the book of Romans in chapter 8. That great chapter, Romans 8. Listen to what Paul said in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? He wrote those things because he had experienced them all for Jesus' sake. As it is written, he says, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He's quoting Psalm 44. No, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For your sake, we face death all day long. We live in a contrary world. Is living in a contrary world enough and experiencing the danger and the opposition and the persecution that that entails, is that enough for you to walk away from the faith? Martin Lloyd-Jones said, We all tend to prescribe the answers to our prayers. We think that God can come in only one way. But Scripture teaches us that God sometimes answers our prayers by allowing things to become much worse before they become better. He may sometimes do the opposite of what we anticipate. Yet it is a fundamental principle in the life and walk of faith that we must always be prepared for the unexpected when we are dealing with God. So will you walk away? You will not be better off without God in this contrary world than you are with God. There was a terrible volcano in 1883 in uh, what is um, modern-day Indonesia. The volcano of Krakatoa in 1883 exploded. It was the largest natural phenomenon that has struck the earth in thousands of years. The sound was so loud of this volcano, volcanic explosion, that you could hear it in San Francisco, thousands of miles away. In an instant, 200,000 people were killed. Friedrich Nietzsche was a philosopher. He was alive and, at the time, and he was adamant, an adamant atheist. He wrote a friend when he received the news that, uh, that Krakatoa had exploded, and he said, 200,000 in one stroke, how magnificent. His evaluation of that catastrophe was markedly different than mine is. See, without God, you have no basis for eternal moral absolutes. And there's no such thing as good and evil, righteousness and, and goodness, uh, darkness and, and evil. There, there's no basis for that without God. If you reject God because there's evil in the world, you're not better off. You don't have a better answer. You're not in a better place. So look back, look in, look up. Finally, look ahead. Look ahead. The Israelites in this psalm are acknowledging that they are in a temporary situation. God is asleep 
not forever. Like Paul in Romans 8, defeat may be our current experience. It is not our eternal destiny. Why? Because of God's loyal love, his chesed. God's loyal love during lean seasons comforts us. So what season are you in? Are you in a fruitful season or are you in a lean season? Probably most of us would say during this shutdown period, things feel pretty lean. There's a way to walk by faith in a lean season. Here, it takes the form of lament, calling upon God. That's our confidence even in this lean season. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for your kindness to us through the Lord Jesus. Help us to be faithful in looking back. You know that when we meet to sing, we sing a lot about the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice because we want to remember. You know, Father, how tempted we are often to forget during lean seasons your presence, your power, your faithful love. Lord, we call upon you to help us and strengthen us during this lean season to walk by faith, to seek you out. Uh, help us in moments of doubt to look back and look in and look up and look ahead. Thank you for Psalm 44 that gives us words to say. May we sing them faithfully, speak them heartfully and, and diligently before you. Wake, Lord. Deliver us from this pandemic, we pray, according to your kindness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is getting old, isn't it? Making uh, videos for you. It's our pleasure to do so, but boy, does it make us long for that moment that we'll meet together again in this room to worship. God be with you till we meet again.